Hello and welcome to the Redeeming the Time Bible Study of Genesis Chapter 1, Lesson 2. This study has been recorded for the folks at the Idaho State Correctional Facilities and is brought to you by the St. Paul Baptist Church of Boise's Prison Ministry Team in conjunction with the 10-Day Church of Christ the King. Our study in Genesis is based on the outline provided by Verse by Verse Ministries of San Antonio. Copyright 2011 by Verse by Verse Ministries of San Antonio. You can find copies of this Bible study along with a host of other great biblical study resources available at no cost on their website, www.versebyverseministries.com. My name is Minister Jeff Smart. Thank you to all the folks out at IDOC and our prayers are with you and for your recovery, your health, your healing, both physically, mentally, and spiritually. Please join me as we open this study in prayer. Almighty Father, Lord God, we're so grateful, Lord, for the opportunity to serve you, Lord. We're, we're grateful for the creation that we see around us, the proof of your existence through, through time and space, Lord. We see all the awesomeness that you can create in six days, Lord, knowing that you could have created it in a single moment. Lord, and we're here together to learn and to study. Lord, we ask you to remove self from our, 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 our minds. Lord, let us rely on the Holy Spirit. Let all the believers who are watching this uh, find some uh, edification in it. Lord, let the truth be uh, told in this video. Let, let the uh, uh, Bible speak for itself and the words of God speak for themselves, Lord. And we ask these things uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so just a little review. We, we know that it was a, it's a two-part book from chapters 1 through 11 is the beginning of all things. And from 12 to 15, uh, the beginning of the Jewish race and nation, that story is told. Uh, it's probably the most important book in the Bible. Some consider this to be a book of stories, but we know it's, it's a, a foundational book. It teaches us where matter, energy, life, marriage, family, society, morality, law, and, and the seven-day work week came from. Uh, it's a book of first. We knew that. Uh, uh, it's the most quoted Bible uh, uh, book, uh, except for Psalms and Isaiah. And this book was quoted literally. The text was quoted literally by Jesus himself. So uh, uh, Genesis is virtually everything we need to, know, need to know about God's person and, and the relationship man has with God. Uh, we know that Moses wrote the Torah between 1405 and 1405 BCE. Uh, it's originally one work. The first five books of our Christian Bible were called the Torah or the Book of Moses. Uh, it covers human history, we found out, from 4,000 to 1,800 B.C. Uh, and from, for the amount that Genesis uh, of time Genesis covers, that's equal to the same amount of time so far in history between Exodus and Revelations that, we, that, that we're looking at uh, so far, okay? Uh, so that's quite, a, quite a, a lot of information we found out in one book compared to all the books of the other Bible equal in the same amount of time. Um, now, we, we found out that... Uh, uh, there were three kinds of heavens, right? The, the, the Jews had three names for heaven. That one word for heaven, Shema, Shema, Shemayim. And it was for three different places, the first, second, and third uh, level of heaven. Uh, we, we had looked at, uh, uh, maybe we talked about the day-age theory. Uh, or I'm sorry, we talked about the gap theory uh, last, last week. Uh, we looked at a couple Bible verses that showed us uh, the irony of, 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 of trying to put a time on God. Uh, we talked about how the first line of Genesis contradicted atheism, pantheism, poly polytheism, radical materialism, naturalism, fatalism, uh, and also that uh, that verses one or two are a summer of the entire chapter. And so one of the things that we need to talk about here, a lot of times you'll see, as Moses wrote, or, or a lot of the times as the Holy Spirit inspired him to write, we'll see sections of the Bible that come out and it's an overview. And then there'll be a section that tells the story that the overview was telling. And then there may be a section that reviews what was being told or, or, or recaps it sometimes, like in Judges. In Judges, we see a, a, a period of time that we talk about where it gives an overview of what the Judges' times look like. Then we see the Judges' times as it's described, and then we see a period there, the last couple uh, chapters of, of, of Judges and into Ruth as a third uh, part of that trilogy of, of Judges, uh, going through the time of Judges and explaining it. And so we see that here in Genesis uh, at the beginning. It, it starts. The Bible starts out that way. The first two... Uh, 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 verses are a summary of the entire chapter, right? And and uh, verse three describes the successive steps of creation and moves forward and forward. So uh, we we saw that. We saw uh, what else did we look at last week? I think that kind of catches us up. We we looked at uh, E equals M C squared at the formula that Einstein gave the scientific community, which was uh, energy equals matter times the speed of light, uh, which is C squared, right? So uh, we see in the first. Three lines of the Bible, the Bible describe the energy being created by the Holy Spirit over the matter, and then God created the light. 
So we'll start there at Genesis 1, 3 through 1, 5. Uh, then God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning one day. So God spoke light into existence. He saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. He named the light and the dark, and so that gives him the, he's the, since he's the creator of it, he has the authority to name it. It, it shows his authority, right? Uh, and notice right here, uh, there's no apparent source. In fact, the, the, the celestial bodies won't even arrive until the fourth day, right? So the light comes from somewhere, but it's not the sun reflecting off of the moon or the moon uh, ref reflecting the sun's light back towards the earth or the sun shining on the earth. There's no celestial bodies. So the light's coming from God. Also notice, we noticed last week, uh, the darkness was created, right? Not just the absence of light. God was creating darkness, right? Uh, so as he sets about to create a world, uh, he has light and dark in it from the beginning. And I think that's a, an important thing to notice. Uh, and it's also important in the pattern, right? So in the first three days, we see God creating spaces. In the second three days, he creates the objects that fill those spaces. And so this pattern, we come to understand the purpose of the creation itself. So we'll come to that answer when we arrive on day six, what the purpose of creation is. But let's remember why God creates both light and dark, right? We discovered that in the new heavens, there won't be any light and dark. It's uh, Revelations 21, 25 tells us in the daytime, for there will be no night there. Its gates will never be closed. Speaking of the, of the city, of uh, the new Jerusalem. So if God has determined that he doesn't need darkness in the eternal order, why did he include it in the first earth, right? Uh, it, 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 consider how God consistently leaks light and dark and good and evil throughout the Bible. In Job 30, 26, we're told, when I expected good, then evil came. When I waited for light, then darkness came. Uh, and in Isaiah chapter 9, we see, the people who walk in darkness will see a great light. Those who live in a dark land, the light will shine on them. You shall multiply the nation. You shall increase their gladness. There will be glad in your, they will be glad in your presence, as with the gladness of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoils. Amen. So God created the world with a built-in message, and, a, and, it, and it was a message about good and evil, right? We learn by experience how light and dark are opposite. We know through our own experience here in the world that light does not have dark in it. When light comes, dark disappears. When dark comes, light disappears. There's no mixing the two, right? So one does away with the other. This is how we, we see sin. We see one exposes sin and reveals glory, and while the other one provides opportunity to sin and produces despair. They serve as, as powerful metaphors for good and evil. So God has already anticipated uh, and planned the entry of sin into his creation from the first three lines of Genesis, right? He's already created light and dark, and he has a reason for those light and dark being created, and he's not going to create them in his internal uh, 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 order uh, at the final age. He is only using those that darkness to show us what sin is and what it can do, right? So these metaphors were built into the creation. It's further proof that, that, that God is intent and purposeful with what he's done and what he's doing, right? So because he already anticipated and planned for the entry of sin in his creation, that, that tells us something too, right? Nothing was happening by accident. When, when, later when we get into the story, as, as you, most of you know the story of, of uh, Snake and Eve, this is, this is God didn't, didn't not know this was going to happen, right? He's planning for it and he's giving men powerful metaphors to work uh, with uh, regarding good and evil, using light and dark as representative of good and evil. So uh, we know that, that God's going to remake the, the future earth. It's going to lack night. It's only going to have day. Uh, in Revelations 21, 4, he says, and, and he will wipe away every tear from their eye. There will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. So things are going to pass away. The first order is going to pass away. And there's going to be a new order. And we know that in the new order, there's going to be no night, no darkness. Right? So... To conclude in day one, we saw that light and darkness were separated. From the first day, God established the passage of time by separating the light and the dark, right? Because now, before this, nothing was happening. Now it's light, dark, light, dark, light, dark. Something's happening, a, a movement, a progression. Like a strobe light, maybe even. It's just like a flash on, flash off, black, light, black, light, black, light, dark, light, dark, light, right? And so it's the, it's the, it's the invention, it's the creation of, not the invention, the creation of time. He has created time by creating a light and darkness that will not mix with each other. They're constantly rotating. It's light, it's dark, it's light, it's dark. So uh, we see creation of time here. So, so far, we've watched God create matter, energy, light, 
and time, okay? And God says one day has passed. So this, this, gives, this gives an opportunity to look at this other uh, theory that we, I mentioned earlier, the day-age theory. Uh, and this theory suggests that each day in creation represents a long period of time, millions of years, millions of years, okay? So let's ask ourselves, why would anyone think that that's what that says in the Bible? I mean, there's, there's, is there anything in the text that leads a person to decide that's what that means, right? And the answer is no, because uh, uh, we just read the three lines. If, in, 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 in Hebrew or in English, they're not, it's not telling us that there's millions of years anywhere. Uh, it, it ha, it, it, as a matter of fact, this theory didn't even come out till the 19th century. For, for, for 2,000 years of the Christian church, 1,800 years of the Christian church, no one even thought this. But in the advancement of the new age, in the Enlightenment period, when men began to think that Darwin was probably right, and they began to uh, make that the leading theory and uh, without any proof, which we can't go into here, there's too, not enough time tonight to talk about the, 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 the corruption of the theory of evolution uh, over the years and, the, and all the things that have been done over the years in science to prove the theory is wrong. Let's not even talk about that tonight. But, but suffice to say, these people who needed this evolution to be true because it's been what's ingrained in society at this point, they need something in the Bible so they can fit those millions of years in there. And so they came up with this day-age theory. So we know that the, the, that the, uh, that the, the day-age theory is trying to put millions of years in it, saying that, the, 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 that, that we're billion-year-old, billions of years old, the, the universe. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's because we, we've been taught to trust science and trust scientists, and, and the science has, has gone that direction. So... Uh, most Christians have been taught that they misunderstand. They, they, they have to understand their Bible in the light of science. So they're taking science and shoving it on the Bible instead of listening to God's word and bringing it back out and looking at the creation as it is, right? So in other words, if the world's billions of years old, how do we understand Genesis 1? What's the, what's the biblical response to Genesis 1 if, if the world's billions of years old, right? Well, in Hebrew, the, day, the word day is yom. And in the Bible, it appears about 2,200 times. 67 times, 2,267 times, and only nine times in that entire Bible, in the entire Bible, nine out of 2,267 times does it mean an age, right? Also notice that in this same section, in this same verses we're studying, he uses the words evening and morning, Arab and Boker. Now, these two words always, always mean a 12-hour period each, right? Right? Arab is a 12-hour period. Boker is a 12-hour period always, right? So, and later in the same chapter, we're going to see the, the author use words for season and age. And, and if he wanted to impart a long time period, he could have just said it. So when we look at the golden rule of interpreting the Bible, we need to use literal, ordinary, and primary meanings of any word when there's no contextual basis to do otherwise. Do not add into the text things that aren't there, Right? What other cross-references could we go to in the Bible? Uh, just to the next book, Exodus 28, which was part of the book of Moses originally, right? Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall do work and all... I'm sorry. Look at Exodus 20 and 8. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work Neither you nor your son or your daughter, your male or your female servant or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with me. For in the six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. Well, listen, the rationale for a Sabbath doesn't even make any sense if the day, the day age theory is, is, is millions of years each day, right? God's not saying that it took me millions of years to make this. So we're going to take a million years and rest. And I want you to take a million years and rest. The, these 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 are literal 24-hour periods, all right? So another place people love to go is 2 Peter, right? 2 Peter 3 and 8, we see Peter say, But do not let this one fact escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. Okay, so if, Peter's, if Peter wanted to teach that a day is equal to a thousand years, that means that creation took 6,000 years and, and God took a thousand years off, or a thousand years of rest, Right? But that's not, that's not going to work. That doesn't help at all if you're looking for evolution, if you're looking for billions of years. You can't shove them into 6,000 years. So that's the first thing. Well, then people say, well, you know, he was, just, he was just, you know, it's a metaphor for that. Well, it is a metaphor. And what he's saying is that God's outside of time. 
God doesn't experience time like we experience time. To God, a thousand years is like a second, right? It doesn't matter. God controls time. We know that God could stop the planet and let Joshua and the Hebrews battle for hours beyond a day. So God's outside of time. That's all Peter's saying. He's not giving us a secret code. If he's literal saying uh, that one day is like a thousand years, right? Then that's what it says. If he's being literal, which he's obviously not being literal because that's not what it is. He's simply being metaphoric in a specific message, which is God lives outside of time. It is not to be translated. God is, he's not saying because he says a day is like a thousand years, we can put millions of years into anything that says a day. That's, there's no logic there at all. It's not contextually sound and it makes no sense. So let's just avoid that theory. Uh, let's move on to the next phase of creation, starting in uh, chapter six. Uh, then God said, let there be an uh, expanse in the midst of the waters and let the, let it separate the waters from, from the waters. God made the expanse and separated the waters which were below the expanse from the waters which were above the expanse, and it was so. God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening, and there was morning, and a second day. So let's take this apart. Two bodies of water, one above, one below, an expanse beneath them, uh, between them, which God calls Shemayim, right? And and what heavens are we talking about here? Now, see, here we can talk about this Shemayim uh, convention again. What fills this space, right? We're on day two, right? So what fills these spaces? The water below the Shemayim, the Shemayim here are the oceans. The water above the Shemayim are, or the waters above, this, this Shemayim is space and atmosphere. So, we understand that there's a sky, Shemayim, there's a space and there's Shemayim, and then there's God's throne room. They call that Shemayim, but they, they had a convention. And so here's what the Jews did. They had first heaven, first Shemayim. That was where the birds fly. It was the, the atmosphere, our air where we breathe, right? Then there was the second uh, heaven, which you can find in uh, uh, verse 15 of this, ch of this chapter. Genesis 1 and 15 shows us that the second heaven is space and the atmosphere, right? Uh, because... That was what God created on the first day, right? And he's going to fill it with the celestial bodies on the fourth day, right? So now he's on the second day, and we're going to see him on the uh, fifth day fill it with birds and so forth, right? So he's creating the atmosphere here. And you can look in uh, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 2 or chapter 12, verse 2, to see the third heaven is God's home. The word meant three different places, and the context would usually dictate which of that places it was, Okay whether it was the first heaven, the second heaven, or the third heaven. And you can you can do your homework on those uh, other verses when you have a time. So when we compare the events on this day to the way God creates the new heavens earth, we see another very interesting distinction, right? In Revelations 21, 1, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heavens and the first earth passed away, and there was no longer any sea. So why did God choose to create a first world with a sea, but removes it in the second earth, Right? What's the message, right? Did he change his mind? We know, we know if we're Bible scholars that God doesn't change his mind. He's not like a man to change his mind, right? God does everything with a purpose. And he knows what's going to happen when he does it. So consider the words often translated sea in the Old Testament. It's tehom, which actually is the Hebrew word for deep or abyss. And remember, he used that word when he described the, 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 the abyss in, in the beginning, right? Formless and void, tohu and bohu. They had... They had a map, and so he's creating space. He's creating the second heavens, right? When he's when he's creating that and putting light and dark together and making a space for the the celestial bodies. But what what we have here is 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 that God is now uh, uh, going to remove the sea, right? When the first earth passes away. So what we find is that the Hebrews word for abyss deep becomes their word for the sea because the Hebrews were terrified of the sea. They were not seagoing people. And when they looked out to the sea or saw the sea, they saw the dark swirling waters and it reminded them of the abyss to home, right? The holding place of the dead, right? This is what they saw when they saw the sea. So uh, the, the name to home meant the abyss and became to be the sea. We know this from Jonah two and five water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. The great deep engulfed me. The great Tehom engulfed me. And we know Tehom, a picture of the ocean here, a metaphor for Jesus going into Sheol in his death. Okay? So, another metaphor built into the creation by God to help men understand death and the holding place of the dead. Mm. Notice in Genesis 49, 25, God also said, 
the Holy Spirit also said through Moses, from the God of your father who helps you, and by the Almighty who blesses you with blessings of the heaven above, blessings of the deep that lie beneath, blessings of the breast, and blessings of the womb, right? So we know the sea becomes a metaphor, a picture of the depths of death, the abyss, and the holy place of the dead. And in fact, the word for, for abyss, as we said, it, it, in deep, the abyss, it, it is that word in Hebrew, tahom. So the new heavens and the, and the new earth, there's not going to be any death. So there's not need for a sea. There's not going to be any sin. So there's not a need for darkness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay. So evening, morning, second day, we can fill our chart in, right? Okay. So uh, we're going on to the third day, Genesis 1 and 9. And then God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the gathering of the waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And then God said, let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit, uh, trees on the earth bearing uh, fruit after their kind with seeds in them. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind. And God saw that it was good. There was evening, there was morning, a third day. Ah, so one of the waters is gathered. This, this one is called seas. How is it gathered? It's all gathered into one place. So what's that say about the land? What that says about the land is, what does that say about the land? Help me out here. It says that all the land's in one place. If all the sea's in one place, then geometrically on this globe we live on, all the land's in one place, correct? Okay, so what does he do on the land? God brings up vegetation. He's, stuck, he's, he's filling, or he's building a space. He's not filling the spaces yet. He is, he is still creating space. And in a created space, there's already living trees with, her, with seeds on them. There's already full, luscious vegetation. There's already fruit on it for when man comes, he can... Pull fruit off the trees and start eating on day one of man, which is, you know, coming up here, day seven, however you want to look at it. But what I'm saying is, in the created space of the third day, God already had fully grown trees, fully grown vegetation. The land was already covered in the greenery of the planet, okay? Now, what I'm saying is, if Darwin, in his travels, had been taken somehow miraculously back to day three and cut down a tree at the end of day three. Depending on what how big around that tree was, he could count those lines back to the center. And how old would that tree be if it had 100 lines all the way back to the center? Moments old. Less than a day old. Less than 24 hours old on day three with 100 rings on it with pine cones already falling to the ground, with needles already falling off the tree. This is how he created it. So what this says is it's impossible to date the creation from what we see today. Because it tells us in the Bible, in the creation account, that it already had the appearance of age. Okay, let's move on. Uh, okay, so uh, let's just review real quick. So, we know that now God has finished three days. We have a chart here. Let me let me just get a piece of paper and we'll show you how that chart works. What we have is is we've been talking about a chart which I haven't shown you, but it's very simple to make this chart. You uh, simply fold a piece of paper into uh, three. Let me show you. You fold your paper into three parts like this, and then fold it in half like this. Okay. And then when we open it up, we end up with six nice boxes on the paper, okay? And then we'll take our boxes and we will put day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, and day six. Okay, so here's our days now. What we'll do, day one, he created uh, light and dark, right? He created uh, uh, time, matter, right? We knew that. Uh, day two, he created, what did he create on day two? Remember? He created the sky, right? The oceans and the sky, right? And on day three, he created the land and the vegetation, so if you're keeping up with the chart, here's what it should look like. 
day one, he created time, matter, space, right? Light and dark. Day two, he created the oceans and the sky. And day three, he created the land and all the vegetation that's on it. All right. And our next lesson, we'll go into uh, the filling of the, of the land. And hopefully in the next lesson, we can get through chapter one and we'll begin to really start to dive into Genesis uh, in this first 11 books where we look at the creation and, and, the, and the beginning of man. And it's a very exciting uh, study, a very uh, novel way to look at it, actually. I have not looked at it before. I had seen this study myself. I, I urge you, if you have time... Uh, uh, or a way to get to it, get, get to www.versebyverseministries.org and check out all the books that they've studied together and that they've published. So you have recordings, you have videos, and you have uh, written study guides that are free to use uh, uh, from the, uh, the goodness of those people and the, and the hard work that they're doing to spread the gospel. So thank you and a special blessing. Thank God for Verse by Verse Ministry. Thank God for the people at IDOC that are working hard to uh, continue to get us in to see you guys, to continue to share the word, to continue to study the Bible with you, even if it's from afar like this. Uh, just wanted to, uh, uh, again, urge you all to continue your prayer. Please continue your study. Look look, look to uh, uh, the Lord for comfort. Look to Jesus Christ for peace. If you're a Christian and you're a believer, you're indwelled with the Holy Spirit, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit gives you gifts from the Holy Spirit that you can lean on, and it produces fruit that you can count on, when you're having trouble, when you're having trial, when you're in the midst of, of, of hard time, lean on the Holy Spirit. Look for joy from the Holy Spirit when you're feeling anger. Look for peace when you're feeling chaos. Look for the fruits that the, the Holy Spirit will give you because you're a believer. And Jesus is there for you. He's in your heart. And he will help you every moment of every day of your life if you just lean on him a little bit. And he wants you to. Okay? So, let's pray. And we'll see you again uh, for lesson uh, uh, Genesis Chapter 1, Lesson 3, shortly. Thank you. Have a great day. And let's pray. Mighty Lord God, we're so grateful for the opportunity to share this time together, Lord. We're grateful for the Holy Spirit, the gift that the Holy Spirit is to each of us uh, that believes, Lord. We pray for any of you that are out there that, that did not believe before they heard that, Lord, that you'd soften their heart, that you'd, that you'd indwell them with the Holy Spirit and give them the gift of faith, Lord, that they might repent uh, to salvation, Lord. And we just ask you to, to be mindful of all of us, Lord, in, in, in the way that we need to be uh, taken care of, Lord, and that's in your will, Lord. We, we ask you to guide us, strengthen us, show us your way, keep us in your will every day, Lord. Protect us uh, in, in your holy and white light, Lord. And we ask these things in Jesus Christ's name, amen. All right. Uh, God bless. We'll see you again.